All right, so before we proceed talking about the conjugate acid base pairs and the reactions first, let's make sure we have this down. When we are talking about conjugate acids and bases, we're looking at the amphoteric species here in the middle. To get to the conjugate acid, remember you need to add in the H plus that way. So that means you add on the H, but you also go up one in the charge, increase the charge by one. If you're going from the species to the conjugate base, you're gonna take away the hydrogen and it's going to go down by one in charge, like so. Couple of little notes too here is there's not many that are gonna go past neutral in terms of the charge. Hydronium happens to be one of the examples here where you can add an H past neutral. So it's H3O plus. Another example is the base ammonia. Ammonia, you can add an H plus to because you can get ammonia, okay, like so. But for most other of the species, you're not gonna add an extra H and make it go to plus one, unless it's some weird organic uh, one that they give you in an example problem. But if they were to do that, they would also give you the entire reaction to work with. So you could see who started with the H, where the H was transferred to, so you could pick out the acid and the base, and then also the conjugates on the opposite side. So for hydronium and ammonium, that's the one where you can go to plus one. Most everything else stops right at the, um, it stops right at the zero neutral, like here, for example, this one right here, you wouldn't wanna go H3SO4 plus. There is no such chemical species that exists, so we wouldn't wanna do that, okay? Hydronium and ammonium, those ones work. Pretty much those are gonna be your only cation ones that you're gonna see here. So let's compare the models and write out the reactions and talk about them. For Arrhenius acid reactions, Arrhenius acid, really all you're doing is showing the dissociation or the ionization here. If you were just doing that to follow this definition, we would do H plus, okay? Cl minus like so, you would just split them apart into their ions. In acid-base terms, they call it ionization, but it is basically dissociation here. You're just separating them. In the Bronsted-Lowry reaction though, you'll also see that the water is a component of the reactants here. And you have to show that H is transferring. It's being donated and being accepted. So following the Bronsted-Lowry definition, we have to look for a donation exception. Uh, it, it being accepted by the other one. So the H here will donate to the water. So we end up getting chloride on this side, like so. And then we end up getting ammonium over here. Not ammonium, hydronium, excuse me. Hydronium. For some reason, blue doesn't want to work right now. Like so. This is our acid, this is our base. So chloride, which is that one going to be, the conjugate acid or the conjugate base? So be your conjugate base, yep. And then hydronium over here is going to be the conjugate acid, like so. Notice the different formats, really just breaking apart. Arrhenius definition says produces hydrogen ions in water. And the bronsted lowry actually shows the transfer here and you end up uh, seeing water as being part of your reaction here, as well as seeing hydronium and chloride on the other side. Now, this example, ammonia, is one of the few weak bases out there that you see frequently in chemistry. So I decided to put this in as a separate example since ammonia is kind of its own case in point. Ammonia acts as a base. So we 
heat phase. And it can show both definitions from this reaction with water. So ammonia reacts with water, if you notice here. And notice, because by definitions it's telling you that it's acting as a base. So that means that the water is transferring the H over, like so, okay? And that means we're going to get ammonium over here. And if the H is being lost from the water, what's the other product? Hydroxide, good. So technically, even though we're really showing the transfer, the donation and accepting going on between them, this also fits the Arrhenius definition because we're producing hydroxide as a product here. So this one fits both definitions kind of in that case. But ammonia is special. It's one of our weak bases out there. Not very many weak bases that you're gonna see that aren't some weird organic one example. But here, ammonia, definitely one used quite often. So this now shows that the ammonia is the base. Water is acting as the acid here, because it's donating. And then over here, we have our conjugate acid and our conjugate base. But there are Bronsted-Lowry bases where you do not see hydroxide in it at all. So we're gonna look at an example like that where hydroxide is not involved in the reaction. For example, this one. We have phosphate reacting with nitric acid. Hopefully out of these two, you can pick out which one's gonna be the acid here. Which one has to be the acid here? Nitric acid has to be the acid because it's the only one that has an H to be able to donate it, right? So it has to be the acid. It's going to donate it over here. So that means phosphate's acting as the base. So over here, our first product's going to be HPO4 with what charge? Minus two, because it goes up one, right? Since minus three, it's going to go up to my, our two minus. That's our first product. And then our other product is going to be what? Just nitrate. Very good. NO3 minus one. Now, HPO4 hydrogen phosphate here, the two minus. Is that your conjugate acid or conjugate base? That's the acid, good. And then nitrate's going to be the conjugate base. But what you should see and pay attention to here is this is an example where hydroxide isn't a part of the reaction at all. So hydroxide doesn't have to be shown in all cases when we're talking about Bronsted-Lowry bases. Case in point right here. A lot of times you'll see hydroxide as part of the product, but not always. Okay. Now, talking about strengths of acids and bases. So you can see on this very complicated, huge chart, there's lots of chemical species that can act as acids and bases. And they have varying strengths. And we're going to go into them in way more detail when we get to Unit 8. Unit 8 is acids and bases. We're going to stick with some very basic principles, though, for Unit 4, sort of like a little intro to it, a little sprinkle of some strength concepts here, and then we will build upon those for Unit 8. Strong acids and bases completely ionize in water. So a strong acid will completely ionize, um, a strong bases will completely ionize in water. Reaction goes to completion. It's pretty much one direction. It's one arrow pointing towards the products. For example, perchloric acid is one of our strong ones. So it's going to go to completion. 
I represented it in both different ways here, the top reaction, just breaking it apart into H plus and ClO4 minus. That one is the Arrhenius type representation. The bottom one is showing it more of the Bronsted Lowry where you're transferring the H. Either way, basically, the only thing left in the beaker is gonna be this stuff. There aren't any reactants anymore. They completely turn into ions. All right. Now, potassium hydroxide is also a strong base. And strong, we know completely ionized based off the definition. So in essence too, what's the only thing you're gonna find left over in the beaker? Is going to be the K plus and the OH minus floating around in the water. It's no longer going to be bonded together. So they completely separate. 100%. 100% we get those products. Okay? Yes? So our weak acids and bases, do they not? No, they do not. Okay. Okay? We will get to the weak definitions in just a second. They do not completely ionize. But this is your list that you need to memorize list of the strong acids and the strong bases. The bases are not too, too challenging because most of them, these are your group one, group one A or group one, the alkali metals. Alkali metal hydroxides. Now we typically don't care too much about francium down here at the bottom. Francium is radioactive. It has a half-life, short half-life of like 20 minutes or something. We don't work with radioactive stuff anyway, so we're not going to really care about francium in, the, in terms of the alkali metals. And usually don't even really work with cesium because it's quite reactive too. The most you'll probably see in our lab is sodium and potassium, occasionally lithium, but just know that these on your, on your list are your strong bases. Now, there are three, these three, these are in group two, the alkaline earth metals. We call them the heavier ones because it's calcium, strontium, barium. So skip beryllium, skip magnesium, start with calcium, strontium, barium. These ones are all considered strong. Once again, we don't really care about radium or RA that's radioactive down at the bottom. I'm not going to really mess with that one. The acids are a little bit harder because there's not really a whole lot of pattern to them. You have your three here. These ones are your halogen ones. Hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, those ones follow the halogens. You just have to remember hydrofluoric is not strong. Hydrofluoric is not strong because fluorine is very electronegative. So that means it stays bonded mostly to its H. It holds on to the H. It doesn't let it detach. It doesn't let it ionize. So out of the halogen ones, hydrofluoric would not be, that's the only one that's weak. The other ones here, nitric, perchloric, sulfuric, these are ones are on the AP list. AP leaves, off of, leaves chloric off the list. This is the one that they say is debatable, but I leave it on my list because the textbook and other resources on the internet are gonna show chloric as being strong. So if you come across like a textbook problem on your mastering chem, you would want to put chloric in the strong category for that particular question. Now I'm not going to ask you about chloric because AP doesn't ask you about chloric, but for say, say for example, in your problem set, it generates a question with chloric in there. Just put it in the strong category and treat it like it's a strong acid. One other thing to note here too about sulfuric. Sulfuric is kind of special because it's diprotic. That means it has two H's. The first H is strong. The second one is weak. So. Only the first one completely ionizes. The second one, HSO4 minus this one, that H, 
This is weak. So that's only going to partially ionize. So sulfuric is kind of an anomaly. Only the first one does 100%. The second one, only a tiny little minimal one amount of it's going to ionize. But definitely get these memorized. You need to know these because if you know all your strong, then anything else you see, you can automatically put it in the weak category. And you can treat it with the weak rules. So you want to keep the strong ones following the strong rules, and you want to keep the weak ones following the weak rules. That brings us to weak acids and bases. They only partially ionize. And when I say partially, it's like less than 5% usually. Reaction has an equilibrium. You're going to see the double arrows with these because only a little bit of it actually turns into ions on the product side. Most of it stays reactants. Weak acids and bases stay together in chemical equations. So, because they only partially, minimally ionize, we want to show that represented in the chemical equation appropriately. So for example, we have hydrofluoric acid being added to lithium hydroxide. The weak acid, which is hydrofluoric, being added to a strong base, lithium hydroxide. So this is the regular molecular equation that you would write out here. We have our hydrofluoric weak acid, we have our lithium hydroxide, the H from here plus the OH from here, that creates your water, right? The other product of neutralization besides water is going to be the salt that's left over. And the salt that's left over here is going to be from the fluoride and the lithium. Those combine to form your salt over here. Now you notice that this one says AQ next to it. That means lithium fluoride is soluble. If you looked at the solubility rules, lithium is an alkali metal, so it stays soluble and, and uh, would follow that rule. The um, water, of course, we put L next to it because it forms pure water liquid. And these both, the reactants start out as being dissolved in water, so they have AQs next to them. The only difference is, is when you're trying to figure out the net ionic equation, you can't separate the weak acids and bases. So if I'm doing the net ionic for this one, I would keep HF together. HF would stay together here because it's a weak acid, because that's weak. Lithium hydroxide, though, is a strong base. So what should I do with that one? It's on our strong list. What do we do with the strong ones? They completely ionize. So we would write this as ions. So this would be Li plus and OH minus. Okay. Then over here, what do we do with our water? Has an L next to it. Leave it. Liquids, solids, gases never separate. They stay normal, right? So here the water is going to stay H2O, right? And what do we know about our soluble salts? We separate soluble salts, right? So this is going to be Li plus, and we're going to have F minus. Soluble salts separate, right? Now, if you look here, this is a complete ionic, the one I did in the middle. You should notice that there's only one spectator this time. What is our spectator ion here? Lithium is the spectator ion because it's in ion form on both sides. So we're going to cross out the lithium. Everything else needs to remain in the net ionic equation. So you keep the weak acid, HF. You keep the hydroxide because it reacts. You keep the water and you keep the fluoride. So when you're doing weak acid and base net ionic equations, you're going to notice that there's only one spectator instead of two. Like for precipitation reactions, there's two spectators. 
but for this one, you're only going to see one spectator. Okay? There is a problem in the problem set where you do this. Just make sure that you look at your strong list. If it's not on the strong list, don't separate it. Keep it together. All right, so relative strengths. Acid-base reaction will favor the formation of the weaker acid and base, or base, and or base. It is important to know that stronger acid will form a weaker conjugate base. They're opposite each other. The weaker acid is going to form a stronger conjugate base. So the stronger base should do what? Stronger base will form a weaker conjugate acid. Weaker base will form a stronger conjugate acid. They're opposite each other. So if the acid's strong, the conjugate base is weak. If the acid's weak, the conjugate base is going to be stronger, and vice versa for the bases. <coughs> And right now, like I said, for this, for our purposes, we're really just looking at relative comparison. We'll get into the numbers and the calculations and all the, the nitty gritty of that later on in unit eight. The kind of the math that proves it. So here shows you, this is the Flynn list of the uh, acids with their conjugate bases and so forth. They also give you these Ka values over here on the side. Like I said, those are the numbers and they represent a relative strength. But like I said, we'll deal with Ka and all that stuff later when we get to unit eight. But as you can see down here, hydroxide's pretty strong on the base side. Hydroiodic they have here up, up here at the top, okay? And so forth. And you notice from those charts, too, that there's a gradient. So it is like this big, long list, and there's like big gray areas in the middle. So now we're going to show you some example problems of what they could ask you about relative strengths and conjugate acid-base pairs and writing reactions here. So number two here. Identify two conjugate acid-base pairs in the reaction shown above. We're pretty good at this now. We look here, follow the H, figure out on the left what's the acid in the base. So if I'm looking up here, nitrite and O2 minus and water are my two reactants. What is nitrite representing there, the acid or the base? base. Got to be the base because it's got to be willing to take a H doesn't have an H to give away, so it has to be the base. H is going to go this way, right? So that means water is acting as the acid. Over here on the right side, HNO3 must be the what? Conjugate acid. Conjugate acid, and the hydroxide is going to be the conjugate base. Conjugate base. And then you can figure out the pairs, right? Nitrite, the base goes with its conjugate acid. So. NO2 minus nitrite, HNO2, those are the pairs for that one. The water, the acid, goes with its conjugate base. So water, the conjugate base is hydroxide. That's simple enough. Now down here, if nitrite, NO2, is a stronger base than hydrogen oxalate, a nitrite stronger base than this, which is the stronger acid? Nitrous or oxalic acid? Oxalic acid is the stronger one. Very good. How do we know this? The stronger base makes a weaker acid. Very good. So nitrite means that nitrous acid is going to be weaker. Very good. And since hydrogen oxalate, the, the base there, is weaker, that means it's producing a stronger acid. Because they're opposite each other. So oxalic acid is the stronger acid, since hydrogen oxalate is the weaker base. Stronger base 
uh, weaker conjugate acid and vice versa. Now I also want to say while you're processing this, a stronger acid by definition is going to ionize the H easier. Stronger acids release and ionize that H plus so that it can become hydronium. Stronger bases are going to accept and bond that H up more readily. So strong acids give away the H, detach the H. Put it into the solution to form hydronium. Stronger bases accept the H and bond it up into the molecule. So it's not floating around by itself, making hydronium. Okay? So the ability to donate, if you're stronger, you're able to detach that eight and eight, detach the H plus and donate it more readily than other ones. If you're a stronger base, you're going to accept and take that H up and bond it into the molecule more readily than others. This is a good one. Hydrozoic acid, HN3. Kind of looks weird, not something we see every day, but we can still apply the rules to it. What is the conjugate base of hydrozoic acid? All we need to do is take off the what? H. H. And what do we do to the charge when we take away an H? Subtract. Subtract. So our conjugate base is N3 minus some random weird anion. We don't know what it really is, but hey, it works. Take off the H, lower the charge. That's what you're supposed to do there. Now, Write the net ionic equation for the acid-base reaction between hydrozoic acid, HN3, and sodium hydroxide. So this is where it gets fun. So now I gotta do one of those net ionics. And if you're not you know, ready to go straight to net ionic, I suggest you write out I would start by writing out the molecular, like so. Now, if we're reacting an acid plus a base, what's one of the products going to be? Uh, water. Water. water, good, because the H from here and the OH from here, they combine together to form the water. And yes, we know that's going to be a pure liquid, L. Okay, what's the other product? in a neutralization reaction like this. The salt, right? And the salt is going to be composed of the cation of the base and the anion of the acid. So that's going to be here of the Na and the N3. N3 minus 1, right? And Na is plus 1. So that's going to combine over here to just form NaN3. All right, now I put AQ next to it. How do I know that one's gonna be AQ? Uh, sodium is always soluble. soluble. It doesn't matter the compound, sodium is always soluble. So that one's going to be soluble. That's part of snap, right? That is part of the snap rule. Sodium, ammonium, uh, nitrate and potassium, the SNAP rule, right? All of the four of those are always soluble. Okay? Now, we want the net ionic though. So, it tells me that hydrozoic acid is weak. So what do I need to do with that one? Do I separate it or keep it together? Separate. Weak acids always stay together. So we keep that one together. So H and three, this one's staying together and it's an acid, so it's gonna be AQ and water. But here we have sodium hydroxide. Is that a strong uh, base or a weak base? Strong, and strong ones do what? They completely ionize, so we need to separate that one. Exactly, separate this one. 
Completely ionized means it separates. So we end up getting them separated into their ions, and if they're in their ion form, of course, they're AQ, AQ. Solid liquid gases, we always do what? Keep them together. So we don't do anything to the water, it stays normal. And we just said the snap rule, sodium with anything makes it soluble, so what do we do to the uh, leftover salt over here? It's gonna be Na plus, and N3 minus, right? These separate, AQ, AQ. They're in their ion form, they're dissolved in water, so they're gonna be AQ. Now, like the previous example we did in the notes, you should see there's only one spectator here. What is our only spectator? Sodium. Sodium is the spectator. So we cross that out, and we're left with our net ionic equation. I'll write it up here so you can see it better. H and N3. And we have hydroxide. And we have water. That would be AQ. And we have N3 minus AQ. So plus. Keep weak acids and bases together, separate strong, separate soluble. And you'll end up getting the correct equation. Aha! Some lovely particle model diagrams. I know, we never seem to want to get rid of these. I'll give you a hint and then I'll let you guys try to talk through this. It tells us up here though, this represents water. So, the smaller little circles, those have to be what? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. And the bigger one that's colored in black has to be? Oxygen. Oxygen. So that should help you try to figure out. Now, pay attention to the H. Where is the H going? Where is it coming from? So that you can create the acid base and the conjugate pairs. So, Take a moment to do that. Now, looking here, going over answers. So, we should notice here, we have water, okay? Tells us that's water. Now, we have two options for water, because you can add an H to water, plus an H plus, Or you take away an H from water, you get hydroxide. Okay? Now, which one do we see in the diagram? We see the hydronium here. Right, so here is our pair for that one. Water to hydronium. The other one isn't as obvious. You see this one has something with H. So what I do is I just call it HA. You could call it HX. You don't know what the other thing is, but it has an H attached to it, right? And it's something else. I use A for anion because that would be the anion of the acid, but you could use X, Y, Z, whatever. You see also this one where it doesn't have it, so I'm going to make that A minus, where it's just by itself. So I can see that this is going to be my other pair here. And we have HA to A minus. Now, out of this, okay, the water has to be acting as what? The base. And HA is going to be the, this is going to be your acid. So A minus is the conjugate base, and hydronium is going to be the conjugate acid, right? So that's kind of how you have to decipher the picture here. 
Now, in all likelihood, if they were to really give this to you in a question, they would tell you, they would say the gray circle, they give you a key with it. So, the acid is going to be the HA or HX or HY, whatever you want to call it. And the base is water, and you get your conjugates out of that. Is this showing a strong acid or a weak acid in here? Yes. Correct. So this would be weak, weak acid, because if you look at the picture, if it was strong, all of these would give away the H plus and ionize the H. But they're staying together. All of these ones are staying together, so that means it's only a partial ionization. Partial ionization means weak. As you can see, only three of them, one, two, three, actually ionized out of the total. But if it was strong, all of them would have ionized. Does everybody get what I'm saying? So weak acid, since only a few donated the H plus to the water to form hydrodium, this is definitely showing partial ionization. Really, if it was strong, we would see all of them as hydronium, all of them as A minuses, because we would have all completely detached there. Now, for a lovely multiple choice question. So, considering the acid base reactions above, which of the following make a conjugate acid base pair? The easiest way to do this is just label your reactions to begin with find your pairs so that when you're looking at your answer choices, you're not getting confused because there's a lot of stuff here. In our first reaction, the one with the purple, H2SO4, is that the acid or the base? So water is acting as a HSO4 minus is the conjugate And the uh, hydronium is going to be the conjugate acid, right? So, remember, the acid goes with its conjugate base. The base goes with its conjugate acid. Those are the pairs for that one. Looking at the bottom one, HSO4 minus, is that the acid or the base? This is the acid. That means water is acting as the base. So sulfate is going to be the conjugate base and hydronium is the conjugate acid. So the acid goes with its conjugate, the base goes with its conjugate. So now it makes it a whole lot easier to look through here. Is sulfate and sulfuric acid even in the same reaction? No. So those can't be pairs. How about the HSO4 bisulfate and hydronium? Is that a pair? No, it does not pair up in either. Do you even see hydroxide up there? No, so C's out. But you look at D, HSO4 and SO4, that's from this reaction right here. That is definitely a conjugate pair. So it would be D. All right, now, this one isn't too difficult if you pay attention to the context clues. If the reaction show below favors the formation of reactants, so here's your keywords, favors the formation of reactants. So which way is this really gonna push? It's gonna push this way, okay? Little arrow this way, big arrow towards the reactants favors the reactants. Which is the strongest acid in the reaction? Strongest acid. Well, first of all, we need to identify which ones are the acids here. What are our two possible acids in our reaction? One possible, other possible. Now, what do we know about strong acids? 
A, I, well, or in this case, it's relative because we're talking about a stronger acid out of the two. Stronger creates weaker conjugates, right? Okay. Now, and stronger acids are more able to give away and detach the H plus to release it to form hydronium and water, right? It gets rid of the H. Which one is getting rid of the H more based off of what's forming? We're forming more HCN and F minus. This is in the beaker here. We have more of these chemicals, right? Those are what are being formed at a higher percentage favoring that side. So when the reaction is occurring, we have more HCN and we have more F minus showing up in the beaker. So which one's giving away the H more readily? HF is giving away the H more readily. The reaction is pushing this way. So the stronger acid's going to be HF. The one that's able to detach, give away the H, higher percentage is the stronger acid. So giving away the H makes us have more reactants in the beaker. Okay? Yes. So how, I, I don't quite understand, how could you tell that HF was the stronger acid? Because we have more of these in the big beaker right here. We have more of this in there. So that means this is staying together and this one doesn't have its H. So we have more of these components in the beaker over here. That means HF gave away its H more often than HCN did. Because it says it favors the formation of reactants. Reactants are over here. Okay, okay. Thank you. So, the stronger one forms the weaker side, right? So, yes, the left side of the arrow is always considered to be the reactants, the right sides of the arrows are always considered the products. So, basically, that's why the left side is being formed, the right side is not as much for this reaction. HF is more willing to donate the H plus, so we're forming more HCN and F minus in this reaction. That is correct. And for the last one here, this one's a little tricky because they give us information in the description about the acids. Carbonic acid, H2CO3, is a weaker acid than sulfurous, which is H2SO3. Which of the five reactions is more favorable? Justify your answer. If you look at the reactions though, which way did they write our reaction? They did it in terms of the what? Of the conjugates, right? Starting with the conjugate bases over here. They gave us bicarbonate, bisulfite, they gave us the conjugates that are starting off the reaction here. What do you know about the acid in comparison to its conjugate? The stronger acid is going to have a weaker base, right? Since it says this one is weaker, HCO3 minus must be the stronger conjugate base. So this acid being stronger means HSO3, that is going to be the weaker conjugate base. So the weaker base in comparison to the stronger base, which one's going to accept the H more readily? Which base would accept the H and attach it and bond to it more readily than the other? So the stronger one is? 
So the reaction that is more favorable must be A, because this one's going to take the H more readily, you push it this way, you get more product out of it. So A being a stronger base, going to take the H from water, make the products more in a higher percentage than the bottom reaction. Now they're both going to make a certain amount of products, but which one's going to be making more product? The top one since bicarbonate is a stronger conjugate than bisulfite. So the formation of the weaker acid is favored. We're forming the weaker acid in this one. Weaker acid, right? Bicarbonate right here is a stronger base. The reaction proceeds right towards the products at a higher percentage than the bottom one. Mm -hmm. Okay. 